Psalm 7 and verse 11. Now, it's just now 20 till, so I'll try not to go over too long, okay? How many believes that? Anybody? Nobody. All right. Well. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Amen. Now, the righteous have been judged in Christ. Everybody say amen. amen. But the wicked, not so. And the wrath of God abides upon them to their own destruction. However, for the righteous, the cross stays the judgment. Amen. God will not judge us because of the cross, and we're thankful for that. Now, what would God do to spare most? Let me change it. What would God do to spare some from hell? What would God, what could God do? Because the whole human race is destined for punishment. So what would God do? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7. The Lord always has a plan, everybody. He always has a plan. And His plan is perfect. Hebrews 7 and verse 10. Hallelujah. Then said, I. Now Hebrews is, is, is back toward the back of the New Testament. And uh, it might be good for some that's well versed in the scripture to help those find these scriptures that are, are looking for them. It's, it's okay. I understand. When I was first saved, I could find Revelation and Genesis, and that was it. <laughs> Maybe Matthew. I get tickled at some of these churches in our fair country. They study in Matthew, 20 years, still in Matthew, right? <laughs> Never get out of Matthew. That's okay. Uh, if any man ministers, let him minister according to the will of God and according to the ability that God gives. All right, so, uh, we're thankful. If they're, if they're ministering the gospel, I'm glad for them. I'm glad. And uh, where's Seth? He, he's downstairs. Oh, Ryan. Have you been to Spirit and Word Church? I just wondering. Uh, anyway, Hebrews ten seven. That's the inside joke. Don't worry about it. <laughs> then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, as it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Then drop down to verse nine. So someone is coming, as the book had previously prophesied. To do the will of God. Verse 9. Then said he. Lo I come to do thy will. O God. So someone is coming from somewhere. To do the will. Of the father God. Amen. He takes away the first. He may establish the second. He, he fulfilled. Took away the old covenant. And established the new covenant. Which is better than the old one. For us. Now back up to verse 5 of that same chapter. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, so someone's coming that's not of this world. Amen. Are you following me? Someone would come from God to do the will of God, to fulfill the scripture. When he comes into the world, he has said, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Amen. So now, glory to God, somebody is coming from another dimension into this world, and the Father God prepared a body for this person that would come for one reason. Amen. Hallelujah. I must tell us today and remind us today that Jesus was the second or the last Adam. Amen. God created the first Adam's physical body from dust of the earth. But the last Adam was from heaven. I said the last Adam was from heaven. Where did the body come from? A body thou hast prepared me. That's what the Word of God teaches. Yeah. 
Now I'm going to go somewhere now where most churches don't teach, but we believe it to be correct. Hebrews, uh, excuse me, John 10 and verse 2. St. John. And we can get this from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Chapter 10 and verse 2. So the one that's coming, or the one that did come, or the one that was going to come, however you want to look at it, depends upon from what angle you're approaching, would come and jump into a body that God had created from heaven. Not of this world. He was the Lord from heaven. Amen. Very God, but yet very man. And he that would come, paraphrased here, inserted those words. Let me read it literally. He that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, who is the shepherd of the sheep? The Lord Jesus himself. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. But he had to enter in through a door to be a legal human being. So God became flesh. That's what the Bible teaches us. In Isaiah chapter 7 now in verse 14, and if you see a head there going across the screen, it's Stacy, my daughter. Don't, don't pay any attention to it, okay? <laughs> By the way, aren't you just enjoying this Zion Word trio singing? Uh, you can go to Branson and pay and not hear that good. Amen. Especially with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's the difference. That's the difference. Praise God. And you know, the guitar pickers is not too bad. <laughs> Need a little help, but you know, we're, we're making it. Isaiah 7, 14. So, what we're going to talk about is, is what I always talk about. The gospel. The everlasting gospel. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. Emmanuel, New Testament, Jesus. Amen. So, the one that would come from heaven would uh, pick up the body that God created in the embryonic state. And God would supernaturally place that invisible embryo into the womb of the Virgin Mary. So I don't teach that God used the egg of the woman to bring forth the Savior. If that be the case, then Christ would not be totally perfect. Because Mary was not perfect. Her egg would have been contaminated by the residue of sin that we got from Adam. So it's more of an inception than a conception. Now you can disprove it if you like, you can't do it. Mary was the incubator. That the Savior would be supernaturally infused into her womb. And there she would carry God manifest in the flesh. Who would be known as the Son of God and the Son of Man. A body thou hast prepared me. God prepared the body. He didn't need humans to help except He needed the Virgin Mary to incubate the embryonic state where Jesus would grow as a natural son in her womb. The womb was the door that the Savior would come through. Or He would not be a legal Savior. God had to become flesh in order to come and pay 
the Supreme Court's justice. For God was angry with the wicked every day, and we were all classified as wicked. And God had a plan. Man had nothing to do with it, period. It, this plan was cut in the Godhead. The Father, the living Word, and the Holy Ghost had this plan before creation. This plan was not kicked in before creation. Even though it was there. Adam failed, and then God kicked the plan in. God did not force Adam to sell the farm. Or he would have been indirectly responsible for the sin and the sickness, disease, and infirmity that's in the human race today. God was not responsible. Satan and Adam was the one. Nevertheless, God had this plan and he kicked it in. Notice in Genesis chapter 3 that God gave the sentence after the fall. And so, what was God to do? He was going to send His own Son through the door or the womb of the Virgin Mary for one reason. Amen. Now I want to go to St. John chapter 1 and verse 10. This one that would come from heaven And in the process from coming to heaven and earth would be infused into the body that God created supernaturally. Everything that God does is supernatural. Amen. Beyond our comprehension. And he came to the door of the womb of the Virgin Mary just like it was prophesied. Minus any imperfections, any sin residue of any kind whatsoever. Perfect. And not only was that the truth, but He had created all things that were and are before He came. He was in the world, the Bible says, and the world was made by Him. So what the Word of God is telling us, that the one that came is the one that made everything. You see, we must accept the fact that Jesus was God, is God, and always will be God Almighty. Or you can't be saved. Because only God can give up His life on the cross. Not that God can die. No, the Son of God died as a human being. This is why He came. He was in the world, the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came into His own, and His own received Him not. So He came to the Jews... And they didn't receive him. In Matthew chapter 21 now, in verse 33. Back to Matthew. I'm going to read some scriptures now. And Jesus, he said in verse 33 of Matthew, he said, to hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it about, digged a wine press in it and built a tower let it out to the husbandman, and went out to the far country. All right. When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Verse 36, And he sent another servant more than the first, and they did to him likewise. Now he's talking about God sending prophets and things to Israel, and Israel killed them. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. They'll reverence my son. He sent him from heaven. Do you understand? Same subject here. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said unto the, themselves, This is the heir, come and let us kill him. Let us seize of his inheritance. They caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Which um, is a reference to the cross. When the Lord therefore the vineyard shall come, 
What will he do to those husbandmen? Everybody say, uh oh. They said to him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him their fruit in their season. Many subjects here, but the kingdom was stripped from Israel and given to the Gentiles, the church. Now, let's go back to John chapter 2 and verse 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 2, 19. Jesus is speaking to people, of course, as he always did. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Destroy this temple. So, so everybody look at me. He said this, destroy this temple. Right. See, we don't get it because we're just reading, but this is, what he, this is what he did. Destroy this temple in three days and I'll raise it up. Now, maybe they didn't catch his, his, his motions. Because they thought, well, he's going to tear down, you know, the walls of Jerusalem, and what's that occurred in 70 AD? But that wasn't what Jesus is talking about. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was his temple and building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. There you go. Thank you, Lord. Which again is a reference to the cross. Now in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, and believe it or not, this is the last uh, scriptures today. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. So we know the account then that God sent His Son, who was the living Word, become flesh. St. John chapter 1. And He was supernaturally infused, incarnated into the womb of the Virgin Mary. He came out the door of the womb. He grew in grace and knowledge as any young man, teaching the, the rabbis at 12 years old, on and on we can go. Uh, they went down in Egypt with, with him, and Jesus was well educated. Don't think he was an idiot. Come on now. He comes back up. They, they got to go to Nazareth, this and that, and they fulfilled all the scriptures, the prophetic word about him. He should be called a Nazarene, and God used taxation and moved them to, to different places at different times, all fulfilling the Word of God. 33 year, or 30 years old or thereabouts, he came to John the Baptist, who was his uh, cousin through uh, you know, natural means, even though Jesus had no earthly father. Now, 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 let me pause there. The blood of Jesus, Mary had nothing to do with it. Now, I know a little bit about how a baby is fed to the umbilical cord. But a baby can have different blood than the mother. Because the baby's life is not dependent upon the mother's blood. Likewise, the blood that was in Jesus was God's blood. Created from heaven, sinless. Yet human. Glory to God. No wonder he had to come and shed his blood. Because it was blood from the heart of the Father. Supernatural. Everything that God does is beyond our comprehension. This is why it takes faith to believe the, the old, old story. But you know what? The old, old story never gets old. <laughs> you can hear Reader's Digest once and that's all, oh, that's enough. But the old, old story about Jesus never gets old. Why is that? Because it's a living reality. It will change you for eternity. Praise God. So John baptized Jesus River Jordan about three years. Jesus went on a, 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 a wild ministry endeavor. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, so forth and so on. They are all trying to kill him. The religious crowd was trying to kill him, but couldn't do it. Satan tried to kill him many times, couldn't do it. 
Because Jesus had to go to the cross. And Satan, in an attempt to kill Jesus before six hours on the cross. You see, if, if Satan could have killed Jesus at 12 noon, then he would have won. Because Jesus had to fulfill all the scriptures about himself. I thirst this and that, I, you know. And, and, uh, but at 3 p.m. Wednesday, the Holy Spirit told him to give up the ghost. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Total faith in a dying hour. But Satan, being the dummy that he is, he thought, oh, I'll send the soldiers and break the legs of the crucified and kill Jesus before he makes the final confession. Stupid devil. Holy Spirit knowing all things and in control of all things. Praise God. Here comes the soldiers. Jesus already said the final thing he needed to say. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is finished, etc., etc. Fulfill everything to the letter. Fulfilling the Supreme Courts of Heaven's request that somebody must pay. Was Jesus paid? I mean, did he pay? Total redemption. For anyone that will accept Him as Savior and Lord today. So the soldiers come to break the legs of the crucified and they broke the legs of the first two and they come to Jesus. Oh, He was dead already. Satan lost again. So the soldier took a spear and thrust it into the heart of the Son of God and there came forth blood and water signifying the death process had already began. And Satan says, well, they'll put him in the tomb. He knew about these things, and I'll keep him from coming out of the tomb. But guess what? Early Sunday morning, he arose. Mary goes to the tomb, sees an angel. The angel said, who do you seek? You seek Jesus of Nazareth. He's not here, the angel said. But, Come and see the place. Listen, where the Lord lay. Amen. Not some shepherd boy. The Lord, not some carpenter. The Lord lay here. Yeah. Glory to God. So the stone was rolled away so that we could see He wasn't there. Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away. That's right. Praise God. God wanted us to know. Then the Jews, oh, somebody stole the body. So what are we going to do? They paid the, paid the soldiers off, you know, shut up about it. You don't want those soldiers that fell under the power of God and couldn't move when Jesus came out of the grave, however He came out. You know they became believers. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Absolutely. Take the money and run. Okay. And they did. They became believers. No doubt about that. Even Pilate said, oh, get, go make it as sure as you can. He knew. You men and Israel. And so all this took place, you see. And the great apostle Peter now, after being filled with the Holy Ghost, say amen. You're not qualified to preach until you're first filled with the Holy Ghost. That's it. Go ahead and get mad, you Baptist and Methodist and Episcopalian Luther Costin or whatever you call yourself. No, Jesus didn't let his disciples preach one sermon until they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Spoke with tongues. Amen. You men of Israel, here he stands up, being freshly filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And he's talking to the Jews. They rejected the Savior. All right. Jesus of Nazareth, the man who proved to God among by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves you know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now who preaches like that on TV? <laughs> oh, you'd be a better you when well, you shut up. <laughs> Whom God has raised up. There's the gospel. 
Where's the gospel preachers at? Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding to it. Why was it not possible? Because he had no sin. He died sinless. That's the reason He alone is the blessed Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. You must accept Him as Savior and Lord and hold to Him. You must fight the good fight of faith just like the third monkey trying to get on the ark of Noah. Get out of my way. You got it? Never give up. Praise God. Then we drop down to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Whom you have crucified, Lord and Christ. You crucified Him. That's what I call a preacher, a man of God. Where are they at today? All oh, those are few around, but not very many. Now, when they heard this, everybody say, ah. Oh. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. That's what Holy Ghost preaching does. People don't like it, but there's a way out. One way. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what are we going to do? What shall we do? Oh. Well, Peter said, repent. <laughs> In other words, change your mind about who Jesus, who you thought Jesus was. See, they, a lot of them did it in ignorance. They, didn't, they couldn't get the revelation. They did it in ignorance. So he said, repent. Change your mind about who you think Jesus was and accept the fact of who He is. Proven by the resurrection. Glory to God. He was seen of over 500 brethren at one time when he went back from where he came. Heaven. He went back to where he came from. Heaven. Having finished everything that's needed for eternal salvation for anyone that will call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Glory to God's best message that the world will ever hear and yet they turn a deaf ear to it to their own demise. We haven't done that. Thank God. I said, thank God we haven't done that. And I won't. Repent and be baptized every way in the name of Jesus Christ. Mission and sin, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everybody said the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you've repented, received Jesus, you know, been born in the Spirit of God, the gift of the Holy Ghost is for you. Don't let the devil rob you. God gave the Holy Ghost for a reason. Pull out that religious nonsense and just say, okay, I want the Spirit of God. I want Him in fullness. I don't like being empty. you got to get there. God knows what He's doing. He can make a powerhouse out of you with the power of the Holy Spirit working through you and me. The promise is in the year, the promise of the Holy Ghost. To your children. To all that are far off. Yes, I want my children saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, I want my grandchildren saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't you? What's the world got? Zilch. As many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words that He testify, exhorting, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Didn't they that gladly receive the word? Oh, man. They, they gladly received the message. Oh, give me people like that. Even in Africa, I said I can't come until I find out about this shot because I'm not going to take no vaccine until I know it's going to be safe. Got to have common sense, everybody. I said I can't travel. They're going to make us take the shot before we can travel internationally. And I can't come until this is resolved. But I'm going to come again. I'm going to come back over there. 
Now they wait. They understand. And so God needs to move. So now we did the best we can until that time comes, okay? They gladly received the word and were baptized, and the same day were added about 3,000 souls. Man, a lot. I've never seen 3,000 souls saved and born again and follow the Lord in water baptism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and, but I, I, I've seen a whole church, right, Will? A whole complete congregation filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. I've seen it many times in Africa. And I want to see it here. So what's it going to take for the church to get on fire for God and get hungry? You know, this virus thing, let me finish the scripture and I'll quit with this scripture here. Then they glad to receive the word of God and were baptized, 3,000, so they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That's what you're supposed to do. Breaking your bread, prayers, Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and they that believed were together, had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. They continued daily in one accord in the temple, breaking the bread and house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praise in God. I think we can save ourselves a lot of heartache if we just praise the Lord a little bit more. Praise Him in the morning, praise Him in the evening, praise Him when the sun goes down. Be thankful for what you have. Amen. They had favor with all the people and the Lord. This is the part I really like. The Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. He's the one that does it. These that are coming to church now, thank God for you because God is the one that sets you in. 